Hey, good morning, Pitt Nass Church. Welcome home. Would you stand with us? We'll get into worship. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was reading the night Alive All my failures I tried To hide It was my tomb Till I met you I'll Sing it together You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of her dark all that I know. Here we go. We obey the Jesus when I obey you because you call my name. sin was heavy but chains break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter I was an orphan now you call me a sin is this the truth I needed rescue my sin was heavy but chains break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter I was an orphan now you call me a sinner, sinner, heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I am the future, my eyes are looking. That's when you call my name. If I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, of the Lord. Amen. He's brought us from death to life. Hey, turn to your neighbor and tell him a good morning.
Hey, just a quick reminder before we get into this next song. If you need to be anointed, if you've got a hurt, a habit, a hang up, something that's been bothering you or troubling you, Pastor Kyle would love to anoint you this morning. And remember, the altars are always open. Anytime during service, you feel the Holy Spirit tug on you, telling you to come down, bring something to Jesus. Please do it. Listen to the Holy Spirit. You'll never go wrong. I know who you are The cross of salvation Was only the star And I'm chosen Free and forgiven I have a future and it's worth the living. I wasn't made. I wasn't made to be tending the grave. I was called by name. Born and raised back to life again. I was made for more. Why would I make? I bet in my shame when a fountain of grace is running my way, I know I am yours. I was made for more. I know who I am. I know who I am. I know who you are. The cross of salvation was only the star and now I am chosen free and forgiven I have a future and it's worth the living cause I wasn't made to be Running my way, I know I am yours. I was made for more. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You call out my name, so I'll sing out your praise. Hallelujah. You buried my past, I'm not going back. called by name born and raised back to life again I was made for more why would I make a bed in my shame when a fountain of grace is running my way I know I am yours and I was made for more I wasn't made to be tending a grave. I was called by name, born and raised back to life again. I was made for more. So why would I? So why would I make a bed in my shame when a fountain of grace? 
is running my way. I know I am yours. I was made for more. I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high. In the lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Yes, I will. Count. I count on one thing, the same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late, he's working all things out. He's working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will, and I choose to pray, to glorify, to glorify the name of all names, and nothing can stand against, I choose to pray, to glorify, to glorify the name of all names, and nothing can stand, come on, see them, I choose to to glorify, to glorify the name of all days. And nothing can stand against. I choose to pray. To glorify, to glorify the name of all days. And nothing can stand against. Oh yes, I will lift you high. In the lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy on my day. Yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I will. Come on. For all my days, yes, I will. Amen, right? Can we believe those words we just sang? We serve a good God, a God whose timing is good, a God who is faithful, amen? May we be faithful in response. Would you pray with me? God, we praise you for your faithfulness. We praise you because you are good. Even in the waiting, even in the unknown, even in the uncertainty, would you help us to continue to be faithful in response? Would you turn our hearts toward you in praise and thanksgiving? God, we thank you for what you are already doing. We thank you for what you are going to do. We thank you for answered prayers. You're a good God who hears and who cares and who loves us. 
You are God who is here with us this morning, and we thank you for that as well. Would you be present in this worship time together? And would you open our hearts to hear from you again today? God, I pray for Pastor Adam as he comes, as he brings the word today. Would you speak through your servant? Communicate to us what it is we need to hear today. And may we go changed and knowing how loved we are by a good and faithful God. Lord, we pray all of these things in your name. Amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Amen. Well, good morning. Good to see everybody. Happy Labor Day weekend. Isn't this great? It's September 1st. We're moving into fall. Is anybody happy about that? I'm very happy about that. Some of you ladies are going, ooh, pumpkin spice. It's coming. All right. It's good, good to see everybody. Good to have our kids in here with us. It's the first Sunday of the month. Let's give our kids a hand. Well, I, uh, before we jump into the sermon today, several of you have said, hey, are you, are you going to have a chance to talk about your sabbatical at all? So I'm just going to take like two minutes and tell you a, a, about my sabbatical. And in our denomination in the past, they've actually changed it to five years, but it, it was every seven years of service in the local church. They, they recommend that a pastor be given a, a sabbatical. And, uh, and so I've been here over seven years. The board uh, approved a six-week sabbatical for me this summer. And uh, it's, it's, a sabbatical is a weird thing because it's not, it's not like I was at home for six weeks doing nothing, but it's also not six weeks of like just working from home either. It's kind of this weird in-between thing. And everyone looks a little different. For me, there were really three parts to it. One was, yes, some unplugging, some resting, some spending some family time. We took a trip, basically followed Route 66 all the way to California and back in a week. It was nuts. <laughs> My wife, who is a firstborn child, had it all planned out perfect. It was great. It was fantastic. Other than the flat tire we got in the middle of the Mojave Desert, it was great. Um, but but uh, so that, that was part of it, some rest, unplug, family time. Uh, but then there was another part of it was visiting some other churches and talking to some other pastors to, you know, looking for things to bring back here to Pitnaz. And, and I felt like that was productive and, and brought some good things back. Uh, and then the, the third part of it, and really the, the biggest piece of it, was writing another book. A lot of you know about 10 years or so ago, I was able to publish a book called Generation One. It's for eleven ninety five online. You can buy it from me for $10. Did I say that out loud? Did I say that out loud? Um, but I was able to publish that, and so this past summer, uh, I wrote a second one. And uh, I took our, the marriage material that Sarah and I do in our All-Star Marriage Conference, which is coming up in three weeks. You can sign up in the lobby. I'm just giving plugs all over here, Kyle. <laughs> Um, but, but that is coming up here in a few weeks. Um, but uh, I took the material from that, put it in book form. My, my kids, I shared this with the primetime group this past week. My, kid, my boys make fun of me saying, Dad, you didn't write a book this summer. You just copied and pasted. <laughs> okay, first of all, shut up. Second of all, there was a lot more. Yes, there was a lot of copying, pasting, but there was a lot more that went into it. So we'll see what happens. I'm giving myself some time to, to kind of continue to tweak it, and I keep thinking of things. Oh, that should be in the book. So I'm giving myself time to do that, and then uh, we'll see. We'll see if we, if we can get it published. But uh, that, that, in a very, very small nutshell, was my sabbatical. So thank you to the board for doing that. Thank you to the staff who took up uh, a lot of the slack for me being gone, but it was, it was good. It was a good time away. It was also good to get back. But one of the things that did also play, a, 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 it was kind of a, it was in the background throughout my whole sabbatical, um, was preparing for a transition season in the life of my family. Uh, because a week after I got back, we took our middle son, Colin, who's here today, uh, took him up and, and dropped him off at Mid-America Nazarene University, and we went from being a family of five under our roof uh, two, two years ago to now being a family of three. And so I knew that transition was coming, and that was kind of in the back of my head throughout that, that uh, sabbatical. And so I mentioned that because today we are in between sermon series. And when I started thinking about a standalone sermon today, we'll be starting a new series next week, my mind immediately went to those seasons of transition in life, probably because that's just where I've been living. 
Um, and, and uh, you know, you, you have a you have a kid move out, and it's a it's a it's a whole thing. You know, on the negative side, um, our youngest Ethan is not 15 yet, so we've had to go back to being chauffeur. Right? That's the neg- on the positive side. We don't have to do a load of laundry every stinking day just to keep up. That's that's kind of nice. So it, we're in this transition, trying to figure out what's what's our new normal. What's normal look like? Having gone from a family of five two years ago to now family of three. And a lot of you are in that same boat. A lot of you in this church just shipped a kid off to college. Or maybe you are a college freshman. You're that kid who is transitioning to life out from under your parents' roof. Some of you, your first kid has been born. Boy, isn't that a transition? Or maybe your second kid has been, re- has been born recently. That also is a transition because now there's two of you and two of them. But let me tell you, the transition to three, whoa, now you're outnumbered. Some of you have been going through that transition. Some of you have lost a loved one recently. And you're trying to figure out what, what does life look like now without this person in my life. Maybe a new job. Maybe you've moved Our church is in a season of transition right now, are we not? We're in the middle of transitioning to a new worship space, possibly, depending on how you vote, possibly tearing all this out and building a new building. We're in a season of transition. Kids and teachers, you've been transitioning to a new school year. The truth is there are are seasons of transition all throughout life. You're never going to reach a point in life where, okay, all the change is over. All the transitions are over. You're never going to reach that point. In fact, the, the one thing, probably the one thing I remember from my college philosophy class was there was some dude named Heraclitus. I'm pretty sure my professor did not refer to him as some dude. But there was this dude named Heraclitus, and he's kind of famous for saying this, one never steps into the same river twice. That's like an ancient philosopher way of saying life is constantly changing. Cue the Thomas Rhett song, Life Changes. Now that song's going to be in your head if you know it. You're welcome. Life is always changing. So if you're not in a season of transition right now, don't tune out today because your next one's coming. It's coming. Well, there was, uh, pro- I don't know, probably 20 years ago or so, there was, a, there was this book called Reflecting God. It was a, it was a book about discipleship. It was a great book. And uh, <clears throat> probably my favorite chapter in that book was when he was talking about the different seasons of life. And he identifies four seasons that we go through. One is the settled place. The settled place is that place where everything's good. Relationships are good, jobs good, finances are good, everything's good. And I think it's really funny that in, for that season in that chapter, um, it's a very, very short paragraph. I think because it's so rare. But it is a season sometimes where just everything's good. But then, but then we go through seasons where we've experienced an ending. And that can be excruciating. We lose a loved one, we lose a job, a kid moves out. That can be an excruciating season. An ending has occurred. But then there's also new beginnings, and new beginnings, that can be exciting and you know, full of adventure. Man, a new start, just kind of a, a, a new normal. And sometimes those endings and new beginnings happen simultaneously, but sometimes in between an ending and a new beginning, there's what he calls an in-between time. And what I'm going to call for our purposes today, a transitional season, And the truth is, sometimes these transitional seasons can be worse than the endings. Because at least when you've experienced an ending, you know know what's happened, you can develop a plan to deal with it. But these, these transitional seasons, these are the seasons where you don't know what's going on, you don't know what to do, you don't know what normal looks like anymore, and you're trying to figure that out. And sometimes that can be harder than experiencing an ending. You don't know what to do because you don't know what's going on and you don't know what normal looks like anymore. In fact, transitional seasons are the times when you're trying to define a new normal. And that is exactly where we find the disciples in our passage today. If you want to turn in your Bible or Bible app to John chapter 21, 
Um, a lot of, John 21, it's the last chapter in the book of John, and usually when we look at, at, John, at John 21, we focus on what we call Peter's reinstatement. Peter, of course, if you don't know, if you're not familiar with Scripture, Peter was one of Jesus' disciples, and right before Jesus was crucified, Peter denied even knowing him three times in a row, right? This big failure. And in John 21, Jesus meets with Peter on, this, on the, the lake shore, and, um, and he, three times, you know, Peter denied him three times, so three times Jesus gives him an opportunity to declare his love and commitment to him. And Peter does it, and then Jesus gives him his mission in life, says, go and feed my sheep, go and feed my people, lead my people. And it's this great story. I love the story. In fact, it's one of the passages of Scripture that God used to call me into ministry. But that's not what we're going to focus on today, because I want to focus on the events that lead up to Peter meeting with Jesus on that lake shore. So when John 21 opens, Jesus has been crucified, he's been raised to life, He's appeared to the disciples more than once. And some of the disciples, as the, as the chapter opens, they're hanging out, no doubt, trying to, trying to make sense of all this. I mean, they're trying to wrap their heads around this. Jesus, who they've been following for three years, who they thought was, was going to overthrow Rome, was crucified on a cross. Whoa, rug ripped out from under him. But wait, he's alive? What, are you kidding me? Like, they're trying to make sense. What does all this mean? And as I picture them, as we walk through this, I want us to just put ourselves in their place, and I want to I just use my imagination to maybe fill in some details that the Bible doesn't give us as I, as I think about this scene unfolding. And so I picture these disciples. They're sitting around in one of the guys' living rooms. I don't know. One of them's in the Lazy Boy recliner. One of them's on the couch. One of them's on the floor. One of them's playing video games on the TV. I don't know. They're hanging out, trying to make some sense of this, and nobody's saying a word. Because their heads are swimming. They don't know what's going on, and they have no idea what to do next. They're in a transitional season. And then Peter breaks the silence. And I don't know, you know, if Peter was, uh, if Peter was from the Midwest, you know, Missouri, Kansas, this, this neck of the woods, um, then, then he, would have, he would have smacked his knees and said, well, because, you know, that's how a Midwesterner begins to say goodbye, isn't it? So I don't, know if, I don't know if Peter did that or not, but I, you know, maybe he slapped his knees and said, well, I'm going fishing. Well, we'll come too, they all said. Now again, I don't, I'm trying to put myself in Peter's shoes. I'm a borderline introvert. At this point, I would probably want to be alone. So I don't, know if Peter was, I don't know if Peter was an introvert or not, but I don't know if he was annoyed. Maybe he was wanting to be alone. Maybe he wasn't, but all the other disciples pipe in. Yeah, let's go. I, yeah, I'm down. All right, let's do it. We'll come too. So they all went out in the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Nothing. Again, put yourself in their shoes. You don't know what's going on. You don't know what to do. Maybe you're a little cranky, so you decide to do what you know best, which in this case is fishing, because that's what they did for a living. And you fish all night, and nothing. What frame of mind are you in at this point? Where, where's the crankiness level at this point on the scale of 1 to 10? What's your frame of mind? Well, those of you who like to fish, when you've been fishing all day, and you're hot, and you're hungry, and you haven't caught a thing, not even a nibble, what is the last question you want to hear? Catch anything? Larry over here is going, I've never experienced a day that I didn't catch anything, but I can imagine that's probably not a good question. Larry can catch fish in a bathtub. Catch anything? Well, look what happens. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. They didn't know it was Jesus. That's a really crucial detail. They don't know it's Jesus. As far as they're concerned, it's just some dude standing on the shore. And he says, hey, fellas, say it with me. Caught anything? Caught anything? Now, at this point, I can imagine Peter giving this dude on the shore the side eye. No, we haven't caught anything. But then it gets worse. 
confession time, okay? Raise your hand if it drives you crazy when you know how to do something, maybe you're even good at it, and some joker that you don't even know starts telling you how to do it. Raise your hand if you find that annoying. All right, as Kyle would say, the rest of you are lying. Right? That is so annoying. Oh, I hate that. And why are we like that? You know, that's just pride, right? That is nothing but sheer pride. But it's so annoying when you know what you're doing and some joker over here starts telling you how to do it. Well, look what happens next. Then this dude over on the shore that they don't know who it is says, hey, throw your net out on the right side of the boat and you'll catch some. So now Peter's looking side-eye at this guy again, and now his jaw is clenched, and his blood pressure's going up, and his nostrils are flaring. I know what I'm doing. You don't have to tell me how to fish. But at some point, I suppose, Peter thought to himself, what do I have to lose? And they throw their net on the right-hand side of the boat, and it says they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. Now, I can't prove it, but I am positive in my mind that as soon as they saw that net filled with fish, their minds went back three years earlier when the exact same thing happened. When they were out in a boat, they'd fished all night, they'd caught nothing, and Jesus says, hey, Throw the net over there. And it was the same thing. The net was so full they couldn't bring it in. I know, I'm positive that as soon as that happened, their minds went back to that day and they realized who this dude, who this joker who was telling them how to fish, they realized who this was. Please understand, I'm not calling Jesus a joker, okay? They didn't know who he was. And the disciple that Jesus loved, let's finish out this part of the story. By the way, the disciple that Jesus loved, that's John. John is referring to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. That has nothing to do with the sermon, but I just want to point that out, okay? Imagine if I started talking to myself, if I started introducing myself in the third person as Kyle's favorite staff member. (laughs) Hi, I'm Kyle's favorite staff member. It's nice to meet you. My money would be on Pastor Matt being the first in line to punch me in the face. (laughs) Jeannie probably was second. So the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, said to Peter, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, for he had stripped for work. I'm not touching that one. He jumped into the water. He headed to the shore. The others stayed with the boat, and they pulled the loaded net to the shore, for they were only about 100 yards uh, from the shore. Uh, And it continues, when they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. And Jesus says, bring some of the fish that you've caught. So Simon Peter went aboard. He dragged the net to the shore. There were 153 large fish, and yet the net hadn't torn. Now come, have some breakfast, Jesus said. And none of the disciples, I love this, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew It was the Lord. And Jesus served them the bread and the fish. And this was the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the dead. I love this story. I love this story. To me, this is one of the, one of the most relatable stories in the Bible because, again, we've all been through those seasons. Some of you are in those seasons, one of those seasons now where you don't know what's going on. You don't know what to do. You're trying to figure out what your new normal looks like. And again, if you're not in one of those seasons now, it's coming. So let me just real briefly point out some takeaways from this. The first takeaway that I love is simply that Jesus shows up. Showing up is a very undervalued thing, I think, in our culture. The the value, the importance of just showing up. Young dads, young dads in the room, young dads watching online, half, half of being a good dad, I think, is showing up. Show up at the events. Show up at bedtime to, to pray with your kids. Show up at the dinner table. Those of you, high school, high school students looking for your first part-time job, college students, maybe you're going to be looking for your first full-time job soon. 
show up. Amen. Half of it. Yes. That, wasn't, that wasn't directed at you, Trinity. He wasn't. That wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> show up. That's half of being a good worker. Show up. I remember uh, when I first became uh, the pastor of our previous church over in Mountain Grove, Missouri, I went and spent some time with a pastor that, uh, he, he's another pastor on our district. At that time, he'd been at his church for like, I don't know, 20 years. And I just went and was just picking his brain, talking shop. And, and the biggest thing that I, I took from that, he says, man, as a pastor, just show up. Show up. Be in your people's lives. Show up. As they invite you, don't be intrusive, obviously. But show up. Show up on Sunday ready to go. Show up. These disciples are going through probably the worst season of their lives to that point. And Jesus shows up. Do not miss that detail. He shows up. I don't know about you, but knowing that Jesus walks with me through all the seasons of life, the good, the bad, the transitional, the hard, the ugly, Jesus shows up. That makes all the difference. I, I was, uh, a lot of you know, I was a hospice chaplain for about a year and a half. I'd, I'd stopped doing that just this past May. And, and with a lot of the patients, I would read Psalm 23. And, and verse 4 is, is what I, I would focus on. It says, and I'm not a King James guy, but there's a few verses and passages in the Bible that just don't sound right if they're not King James. And Psalm 23 is one of them. And so, so the, this is the new King James. It says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Because it's not scary? Because it's not hard? No. Because you're with me. You, God, are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. Even when we walk through the darkest of times, God shows up. God shows up, and that's why we don't have to fear, because God shows up. No matter what season you're in, good, bad, transitional, if you are a follower of Jesus, know that he is with you. If you're not a follower of Jesus, we'll talk about that in a second. He's with you. Well, let's be honest. It doesn't always feel like he's with us, does it? It doesn't always feel like it. And as I thought about Jesus showing up for these disciples, I, I was thinking about what they were doing when he showed up. They were just fishing. They, they were doing what was most comfortable to them. That's what they knew. They'd probably, they'd probably been fishing their whole lives. That's what they knew. That's what they were most comfortable with. Now, I don't know if, if there was anything necessarily spiritual about them going out in the boat. Maybe there was. Maybe it was being out in creation. Maybe that's why Peter had that idea. For some people, that's a great place of spiritual comfort is just being out in creation. I don't know. Um, but, but let me ask you, and maybe this is taking a jump, but um, what, what is your, where is your spiritual place of comfort? Where is your spiritual place of of comfort. We, we talk a lot about spiritual practices. Those are activities that draw us close to God and, and help us sense his presence with, them, with, with us. It's things like reading the Bible and praying and fasting, maybe reading a devotional. Maybe there's, a, maybe there's an author that, that the way this person speaks and puts things into words maybe just really helps you kind of connect with God. Um, may, for some people, it's journaling. Maybe for you, it is being out in creation. I've had more than one person tell me over the years, man, I don't feel any closer to God than when I'm out tending my garden. Maybe that's you. Maybe it's music. For me, the last probably eight or 10 years, it's, I, I'm, I'm not a musical person. I don't, I don't sing. I don't play an instrument. But the last 10 years or so, like just listening to worship music is where I just really sense God's presence with me. We're going to sing a song here in a minute that has been one of those places of spiritual comfort for me at different times in the last six months or so. So for some of you, maybe it's music. But if you don't know what your spiritual place of comfort is, explore those spiritual practices until you find it. Because when you're going through those hard times or those transitional seasons, those are the things that help pull you through and remind you God's with me. He's with me. 
Because it doesn't always feel like it, does it? And in those times when it doesn't feel like it, that's when we have to go to what we know up here. You know, sometimes you know something up here, but you don't feel it. And when you don't feel like God is near, that's when you got to go back to what you know from his word, which is he is with you. In your spiritual place of comfort, those things that just draw you into his presence, you got to know what those are because those are going to help you tune in to what you know here, which is God is with me. He shows up and he's showing up for me right now. I feel like I can face anything in life if I know Jesus is showing up and he's going to walk with it through me. Now, having said that, Jesus shows up but he doesn't always show up in ways we expect, does he? If I was writing this story in John chapter 21, if I was just making it up and writing it, uh, you know how I think I would have Jesus appear to them? I would have him walking out on the water to them. I mean, that was a previous miracle he, that they'd seen. I would have Jesus do this incredible, spectacular thing of walking out on the water. I mean, John, he's finishing up his account here. He's almost to the end. What a, what a climactic, incredible way to end his account. Jesus just walks out on the water to him. Wouldn't that be great? That's, how, that's what I would write if I was writing this. But I didn't write this. John didn't write this or make the, he wrote it, but he didn't make it up. Because what Jesus does, he doesn't show up in this dramatic, spectacular thing. He just shows up, unrecognizable, I would add. We don't always recognize when Jesus has shown up, do we? He shows up unrecognizable, just making breakfast. I love that. He doesn't show up in this big grand, he doesn't make this grand, miraculous, spectacular interest. He shows up unrecognizable, making breakfast. How ordinary. How mundane is that? Folks, be careful about chasing the spectacular and the miraculous. Do we pray for miracles? Of course we do. And we give God thanks for them when they happen. Yeah, we pray for miracles, but be careful about chasing the spectacular and the dramatic and the, mir- and the miraculous because sometimes he just shows up in the ordinary and the mundane. Sometimes he shows up that way. I was thinking about this um, on the way in this morning. I was thinking about Elijah. A lot of you know the story. He's a prophet in the Old Testament, and he's going through this season where he's depressed and even suicidal and... and um, it says there's this earthquake, but God wasn't in the earthquake, and there was this great mighty wind, and he wasn't in the wind, and it goes through these several things, and it says, and it says there is a gentle whisper. Sometimes God shows up in the, the grand, glorious, miraculous thing, and sometimes he, he shows up in the whisper. You ever been doing something ordinary, just, I don't know, Washing dishes or loading the dishwasher or folding laundry or mowing the lawn or building something in your garage, just something kind of ordinary and mundane. And this, maybe this thought just pops into your head and, and you, you just kind of have this peace. God, God's with me. Thank you, God. You ever had that happen? You ever been talking to a friend, just having a, a, just an ordinary conversation with a friend and they say something and, and something kind of clicks in your mind and you're just, thank you, God. That's God showing up in the ordinary. That's God showing up in the quiet whisper. It's really cool when he shows up in the miraculous and the spectacular, but sometimes he shows up in the ordinary and the mundane. But make no mistake, he shows up. He shows up. And right now, there's probably some of you in this room or some of you watching online, you need to hear that. Because you're going through some hard stuff. And I want you to hear me say, he shows up. Not always in ways that you're looking. But he shows up. And when he shows up, he knows just what we need. He knows just what we need. And what these, I'm assuming, hangry disciples needed in that moment was breakfast. 
So maybe my takeaway from this, if you're going through a hard time, get yourself a good breakfast. <laughs> Go to Bob's. Mindy's Bob's open tomorrow on Labor Day. No. Go Tuesday. Go to, take yourself to Bob's. Order the half cowboy or the whole cowboy. I'm not going to judge. Order it with all three meats. Have a pillow gravy on it. I'm just saying I've never been sad eating that. Bindi, I expect 10% of your tips this week for <laughs> doing that. First thing these disciples needed was breakfast. I don't know what you need right now, but will you trust that Jesus knows? Will you trust that Jesus knows just what you need right now? I remember it blew my mind when we, Sarah and I were first married. We had no no money, no money. Every week, every month was a grind. Oh my gosh, are we going to be able to get the bills paid? And I remember the mind-blowing revelation I had one day that God even knows the dates that my bills are due. I can't tell you the amount of comfort and strength I got from that. Amen, amen. Jesus knows what you need. When he shows up, he, know, he knows what you need even better than you do. And so, again, let me ask you, are you going through a transitional season right now? As a follower of Jesus, will you trust that he is with you? And if he's not showing up in some miraculous, spectacular way that you're hoping, will you trust that he's there in the ordinary and in the mundane? I mean, is Jesus there in the miraculous healing from cancer? Yes. Is he there in, in the daily or the weekly um, um, chemo treatments? Yeah, he's there too. Will you trust that he's there, even if it's not in the miraculous, incredible ways? And will you trust that he knows what you need even better than you do? And if you're not a follower of Jesus, maybe you're here, maybe you're watching online. I, I, a while back, I had a friend, we don't have many trees at our place, and, and I had a friend say, hey, you know when the best time is to plant a tree? Ten years ago. <laughs> he said, you know when the second best time is to plant a tree? Today. Salvation's kind of like that, too. You want to know the best time to receive Jesus as your Savior? Yesterday. You know when the second best time is? Today. Today. Believe in him as your only hope of salvation. Commit yourself to following him the rest of your life. And if you don't know Jesus and you're going through a tough time and you're thinking, you know, if God was real and if he loved me, he wouldn't let me go through this right now. Would you consider the possibility that God loves you so much that he's willing to let you go through this tough time as a way to get your attention and as a way to bring you to a point of realizing how much you need him so that you turn to him and then you can really begin to see that he does love you? Would you be willing to consider that possibility today? Make the decision today to follow him. So as the band comes up, let me leave you with that that verse that I mentioned as we read it that I I love. Uh, It's the second half of verse 12. It says, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. They knew it. If you are going through a season of transition right now or, or any difficult season, My prayer for you is this. My prayer for you is that Jesus will show up in a way that you'll know it's him. Whether it's some big thing or whether it's in an ordinary way, I'm praying for you that he will show up in a way that you'll know it's him. You won't have to ask, is this him? Is this God? Is this Jesus? You'll know. That's my prayer for you today. That you'll know it's him. You'll know he's there. You'll sense his presence, and you'll know that he's got you. He's got you. I want to ask for a show of hands. 
But I'll ask the question, is that something you need to hear today? God's got you. Whatever season you're in, he's got you. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the knowledge and and the truth from your word that you are with us. You do show up. So many examples from scripture where you show up. And Lord, I do pray for anyone in this room right now or anybody watching online who just needs to sense your presence. Pray that right now they would. And right now we choose to worship you. Whatever season we're in, we choose to worship you now because you deserve it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with us as we sing. If you'd like to come forward and pray about anything, feel free to come. I've been walking by troubled waters here in the shadow all alone. I've been worried about tomorrow, stuck in a world I can't control. And I met you as a savior, and I found in you a friend, and I've seen you as a healer, my help in my defense God you've been my provider but right now what I need is you to be my friends of peace come and be my friends of peace I've been wrestling with my demons, fighting a war inside my mind. And I've been swallowed by all my problems. I just want to leave them all behind. As I met you as a savior and I found in you a friend. I've seen you as a healer, my help and my defense. God, you've been my provider, but right now what I need is you to be my friends of peace. Come and be my friends of me. Peace like a river flow. Peace like a river flow. Peace like a river flow. Peace like. 
see And I found in you a friend I've seen you as a healer My help and my defense God, you've been my provider But right now what I need Is you to be my prince of peace We're going to invite the ushers to come forward at this time. Lord Jesus, we thank you today for who you are. God, we thank you that you can give us peace, God, in the midst of storms. And Father, today, with so many watching online and many that are, that are in here today, some of us are dealing with anxiety and stress and worry for the days ahead for all the different things, Lord, that might make up our life. Father, would you just come alongside us, Father, in a way that's just your steady presence. Lord, as Adam said, you're in the miraculous, and you do. Lord, we see stories of you walking on the water, Father, and showing up in big ways and touching people and healing leprosy and all those things. But, Father, you're also there in just the ordinary moments in the in-between times that doesn't necessarily have this big entrance, Lord, but we give you praise, Lord, for who you are today. Be our peace, and we thank you, and we give you praise. In Jesus' powerful name, everyone said amen, amen. Let's give God a hand as we sit down today. He is so good. Well, good morning. Good to see all of you here today. If you are new and we haven't met my name's Kyle. I'm, I'm one of the pastors here, and we have just a few reminders for us today. Right there in front of you, we have Connect cards. And if you are new um, today or maybe in the last few months and you'd like us to find your information out, we'd love to know that. You can just uh, fill that out, drop that in the offering boxes. Also, maybe you have a question. Uh, maybe it's about one of our small groups or how you can get connected. You can also use that connection card um, as a communication card, we encourage you with that. Don't forget, if you're a college student, we are feeding you every single Sunday. And again today at 1145 over at the homestead, which is just straight west here, about 200 feet. And uh, we would love to, to have you come and eat with us. Don't forget about Celebrate Recovery. God is doing some amazing things on Monday nights. Amen. And so uh, that's on seven at, that'll be at 7 o'clock. And then Wednesdays have started back up for all ages at 6.30, and we now also have nursery available on Wednesday nights. Let's give God a hand for that. That is a big deal. And so that's also, don't forget about a lot of different small group options that are coming up. Starting September tw or S Sunday, September 22nd, we'll have a Connect 101 starting point class. So if you are new or would like to get connected, we encourage you to come be a part of that. Um, it'll be after the second service. We'll have a light lunch, and you can learn more about Pit Naz and meet some of our staff, and you can sign up for groups as well. Speaking of groups, there's an, a, a table in the lobby. There's several things that you can do at that table. Again, sign up for small groups. Grab our Connect 6 resource that has a lot of groups and activities and ministries. It's really the booklet you need um, to get going at the church. Don't forget about the All-Star Marriage Conference. Pastor Adam talked about his book that he just finished reading. Uh, Adam and Sarah will be a part of that September 20th and 21st. Say that with me. September 20th and 21st. Now that was terrible, guys. That was absolutely terrible. I don't know if it's because the lights are dim and it's Labor Day weekend. Okay, let's try this again. September 20th and 21st, okay? Don't forget about that. Um, we have a women's ministry trip uh, to see Esther at Sight and Sound Theater in Branson, October 5th. Um, they'll be signed up at the group tables. You can follow the Pit Naz women on Facebook for more details. Also, if you have not liked our Pit Naz Facebook page, um, and we encourage you to go out and do that. And then finally, don't forget about the congregational vote. We're, we voted last, uh, the last couple of, or last week. We're voting today. And then next week, if you are a member, you'll get an official member ballot. 
to vote on the plan out in the lobby. And if you um, are not official member, you're still welcome to vote. We'd love to have your voice. You can also go out to the table and we'll give you a different sheet. So don't forget about that. And as always, don't forget the Church Center app. It's got all of our information on there if you haven't had a chance to download it. But isn't God good? He's so good. Let's stand together this morning. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face towards you and give you that peace. Have a great day. Happy Labor Day weekend.